Praise the Lord. It is an honor to be able to share and to bring the word of God to your hearts this afternoon. If we turn, please, to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to read the first nine verses, verses 1 through to 9. Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through to 9. This message is titled, A Bride Adorned for Her Bridegroom. A Bride Adorned for Her Bridegroom. Revelation 19 and verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Amen. And so, Father, again, now we do ask, Almighty God, for your grace from heaven. I ask you, Lord, to draw a clear distinction this afternoon between man's strength and your strength, Lord. Between man's ability and your, ma- and your ability, Father, that no man may, Lord God, boast in your sight. Father God, I ask, Lord, earnestly with everything that is within me, Lord, you know who I am, you know my weakness, you know my ability naturally, Father, and I ask you to exceed it, to excel it, and that my Lord this afternoon would be wholly a supernatural affair, Lord, of your working, of your grace, of your power, to the glory of your name, Lord. And I just ask that you would exalt the name of Jesus Christ above every other name this afternoon, that no man may boast, Lord, when everything has been said and done. I ask this, I ask for the Spirit's grace, his anointing, his enabling power now. I earnestly pray this, I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 A bride adorned for her bridegroom. Now, if I was to ask you this afternoon who Jesus Christ is to you, many would rightly respond perhaps by saying he's my Lord, he's my King, he's my Saviour, he's my friend. And all such titles without a shadow of a doubt are true and they're wonderful. To him I give my all, my Lord, my King, to him I gladly bow my knee. My Saviour, to him I owe the debt of love. My friend, to him my heart I bear. But there is one title missing which, I must admit, doesn't so often come to mind when we ask the question, who is Jesus Christ to you? And the facet that I have in mind is Christ Jesus, my husband, my husband. Whilst each title sheds a different light on a facet of our relationship to Christ and his to us, there are many more that I could mention besides Christ our shepherd, Christ our redeemer. We could speak of Christ our great high priest. But the title brings of husband brings to mind something different from each and every one of those which all have a unique facet to shed on who Christ is and who we are to him. But the title husband brings to mind 
that facet of fidelity, fidelity, the words that come to mind are the words in Matthew chapter 19 and verses 5 and 6. Man shall cleave to father and mother, or rather man shall leave, sorry, father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Now I'm going to read a few verses today, and for time's sake, I'm not going to turn to every single one of them. I'm going to merely quote them. I have them written down here, although there will be passages that we will turn to. What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. We're living in an age of what rightly could be called a wicked and an adulterous generation who regard not the sanctity and the fidelity of marriage. We see marriage is greatly under attack in the age and the times in which we live. Statistics reveal that in my own country of England, Wales included, that 42%, that's not far from one in every two, marriages end in divorce. Cohabiting couples now form Cohabiting couple families now forming the fastest growing family type in the UK. What does this all say to us about the sanctity and the fidelity of marriage? Up to the 1850s when I was looking at the statistics, up until just the turn of the 20th century, the figures for the amount of couples divorcing in England and Wales did not exceed 500 did not exceed 500, these are national statistics. In 1858, there were a mere 24, 24 recorded divorces. And by 1940, this, or the 1940s, this figure had risen to above 10,000. 10,000, that's a 1,900% increase. By 1970, this figure had risen even further by a further 400% to above 50,000, that's 1970. And by 1972, within just two years, this figure had more than doubled, with recorded divorces reaching above the 100,000 threshold, where they have remained ever since. 2013, in our literal domino effect across literally the whole world, we saw in 2013 the passing in England and Wales of laws to redefine the God Institute or God-given institution of marriage to now allow for what? Same-sex marriage. And dear brothers and sisters, I ask you again, what does this say to us about the fidelity and about the sanctity of marriage? And I simply answer by saying what I've already said. It tells us that we are living in a generation full of adultery and full of wickedness. A generation to whom marriage means absolutely zero, nothing. Now, why do I say all of this? Because my fear is that this deadly poison has seeped into the church in more ways than one, not least in our understanding of Christ, our husband. Christ, our husband. And I heard, we read in Revelation 19 and verse 6, as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, his wife hath made herself ready. What do these words mean to each and every one of you this afternoon? The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Christ my Lord, I freely give him all. Christ my King, I gladly bow the knee. Christ my Saviour, to him my love I pour. But what I ask of Christ my husband? I say, Christ my husband, to him I owe my fidelity. I owe my loyalty. I owe my faithfulness to him, 
my husband. The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, his wife has made herself ready. Ready for what, I ask this afternoon? Well, it tells us in the passage for the marriage, for the marriage, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Now, when we look at that verse, it almost seems to be a contradiction. It seems to be a contradiction because in it, it suggests that we are the wife, that Christ is our husband before the marriage. The marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. How can one be called the wife before the marriage? I thought I would be his wife and he would be my husband upon marriage. But here we see that one is called the wife, namely us, before the marriage. What does this mean? Well, in order to understand this, we must understand a little bit about what is involved in the Jewish wedding. Because as I said, the Western mind tends, myself included until I look this up, tends to associate things different through tradition and through really the low ebb at which marriage plays in our society today. Let's just face it. Now, some translations of the Bible, the NASB, the ESV, just some examples, use the word bride. Perhaps in your Bible it says the marriage of the Lamb is come and the bride has made herself ready. The King James and the New King James, I believe, says the husband has made herself, or sorry, the wife has made herself ready. Now, what does this all mean? Well, it is in this word bride where we understand and really find the solution to what we're trying to look at this morning or this afternoon at this seeming contradiction. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, if you turn there please, I just want to try to bring some teaching to form the foundation before we go on to build. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. If you just keep your finger in Revelation 19, 6, we will come back there. We'll understand this shortly. Paul writing to the Corinthian church says this in 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste vir um, virgin to Christ. Now in our modern Western vernacular, the word bride, which many of your translations will have there in Revelation 19 and verse seven, the bride has made herself ready. In our modern vernacular, the word bride really refers to what? Well, it refers to a woman on her wedding day or just before her wedding. She's not yet married. She's the bride and they're going down the aisle, as it were, to get married. However, in Jewish custom and indeed in many customs across the world and many other cultures, before the marriage ceremony itself, there was what was called a betrothal period. A betrothal period. We've just read it here in 2 Corinthians 11.2. Paul said, I've espoused you or I've betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, betrothal in ancient times was really far more than what we today in our Western culture deem engagement. I mean, when someone says they have been engaged or they are engaged and to their fiancé, we, we don't think in our mind they're already married because in our culture they're not. There's a ring being given, an engagement ring, but oftentimes many people who say we're engaged, it never really perhaps materialises into the actual wedding. They get a few hits and buffs and, and then they're, they're separated and it's no big deal. They, they leave that and they go on to find another. 
But in Jewish law, marriage was a two-step process, and it's really important that we understand this. The first stage in the marriage was the betrothal or the espousal period. In Hebrew, it's known as the Kiddushin. And the second was the marriage ceremony itself, which was known as the Nisuin. So you had the betrothal period, the espousal period, and then after that, the actual marriage ceremony itself. Now, in a Jewish wedding, the betrothal stage was an absolutely esteemed part of the marriage. It was non-negotiable. You don't buy step it and suddenly enter into the marriage ceremony because the two were part and parcel of the package and of marriage itself. And we see what would happen. It formed the betrothal or the espousal, formed the most binding and legal part in the marriage. It was here where the marriage contracts were exchanged, where they were signed, where these contracts contained solemn oaths that they swore to, to uphold. It was at the betrothal stage, at the espousal period, and uh, where the ring would be placed on the finger of the bride. And once the ceremony was complete, this betrothal period, the woman was now legally the wife of the man, legally, at that point, was legally the wife of the husband. And hence the word bride, I have an 1828 um, dictionary, an American dictionary of the name Noah's, um, not Webster, Noah Webster's um, dictionary, American dictionary. And if you look up the word bride in there, I believe it says that it originally meant a woman espoused, a woman espoused. We use it in a different way in our Western vernacular, but the word of God, remember, isn't our Western vernacular, so we need to understand these things. Turn please to Deuteronomy chapter 22. I do want to bring this out and we will come to an application in due season. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verses 23. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 23. And the reason why I'm turning here, because at the point of betrothal, that woman was now the wife of that man, now the husband. And sexual infidelity at that point was punishable by death. They were, by every sense of the word, married, though the marriage ceremony, as it said, the second part had not yet been done. And we will come to this. In Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 23, it says, If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband, notice, betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, his neighbor's wife, at the point of betrothal, he has humbled his neighbor's wife. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, we're all familiar with the uh, narrative of Joseph and Mary. When Joseph found Mary with child and it suddenly dawned upon him, well, hang on, I'm betrothed and she's a virgin. How can it be that she's found with child? And he minded to do what? To put her away privately, to officially divorce her, because by every sense of the word, even though they were betrothed, she was his wife and he was her husband. In Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18 and 19. These are familiar words, but I do want to read them. In Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, they were betrothed. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a, her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. To put her away privately. Notice the language being used there. Joseph, her husband. Joseph, her husband. When Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together to consummate the marriage, at the stage of betrothal, the word of God tells us what? That Joseph, her husband. 
Being a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privately, to divorce her. And so to break that betrothal, to separate at that point, one would have to obtain a letter of divorce. It wasn't something like in our culture where we can say, well, it's just off, let's call it the wedding off. No, in every sense of the word, she was now your wife. And if you deemed to do that, you would need to issue a letter or a certificate of divorce. Now, an intervening period of time, as much as a year when I was looking at this, would elapse between the betrothal period and what? The wedding ceremony itself, up to a year sometimes. The husband would leave his bride and would do what? He would go to prepare a nest, a home for his wife, so that upon his return, he could collect his bride and take her, take her back to their new home. Did not our Lord say what in John's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 2? I go to prepare a place for you. At the end of this, as I said, he would come and he would collect his bride. And friends would be of the bride. This is talking now of the marriage ceremony itself. A procession would leave from the house of the bridegroom. And he would go out. The procession would go to with him amongst them to meet his bride. They would be traveling where? They would be traveling to the house of his wife and the friends of the wife the friends of the bride would go out to meet the procession where do we hear this language being used in Matthew's chapter 25 in the parable of the virgins turn there please Matthew chapter 25 and verses 1 through to 13 this was the actual marriage ceremony the betrothal had already happened and now the bridegroom was coming to meet his bride and to take her back to the home he had prepared. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1. Upon the arrival of the bridegroom, the bride would be adorned with white, with the wedding dress, with the veil, and the two would go back to the marriage supper back to a wonderful feast where all their friends would be present to welcome the bride and the bridegroom. And we see this here pictured in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. These are friends of the bride. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him where? To the marriage. To the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know ye not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Upon the Lord's return, the bridegroom comes back for his wife, namely us, the body of Christ. And he's coming to collect a bride that has been faithful to him, to take us back, as it were, to the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will feast where we will celebrate, where we will be in the presence of our husband, where we shall see him face to face. And in this we see here that what was this parable saying? What was the point of the parable? Well, it's simply this, as indeed it forms one of three parables all around that particular area in Matthew chapter 24 as it ends. You have here the, the parable of the just servant or, or, or of the servant who begins to smite the fellow servants. Why? Because his master had gone away and appointed him to be lord over his household. We have here the parable of the ten virgins. We have after that the parable of the talents, talents 
where the master goes into a far country and comes back. What is the point in all of these parables? Well, it's simply this, that our Lord has gone into heaven, risen from the dead and ascended to the right hand of God and is what is coming back. And there's an intervening period of time from the betrothal period till when the bridegroom comes to collect his bride. And the word of God is trying to tell us not once, not twice, but three times, be ready, be ready. Indeed, as it says in Matthew 24 and verse 44, be ye also ready, for in such a time as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. In a time, in such a time as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And in all three parables, it involves one, as I said, who has gone away for a season, who upon his return seeks what? Seeks faithfulness. Seeks faithfulness to the ones given the talent. He seeks faithfulness from his servants. From the one who had been put in charge of his servants, he was seeking what? Faithfulness. Tend my sheep. And we see here that the virgin's duty was what? To go ahead to meet that bridegroom, to tarry. You know, that when he, even though he should tarry, that they would have their lamps trimmed and they were to escort the bridegroom to the house of the bride and what they were not ready. Five were and five were not. And the Lord is not just putting this in God's, in his word for entertainment. He's trying to tell us something that upon the return of Christ, there are going to be those who are not going to be ready to meet the bridegroom when he comes. Now that's sobering. And I haven't just made that up. It's what the word of God is trying to tell us. Be ye also ready. Our Lord has warned us again and again and again. He's not present amongst us today to warn us. Because if he was, guess what he would say? He would say exactly what is written here. And so we need to take heed to what he has said. Because he's not saying it again. He said it once. And he's saying what? Be ready. Be ready. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Turn back then please to Revelation chapter 11, was it? I've forgotten. <laughs> Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. And we will, having laid the foundation, we will build upon it. Revelation 19. I'll read from verse 7 again. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted to the wife that had made herself ready that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now I want to ask you a simple but an honest question, or a simple question that you need to, before God, give an honest answer to. If the Lord should come tonight to collect his bride, namely us, in this room who are saved and born again, would we be found ready? Would you be found ready? I was speaking to a gentleman in Wolverhampton not too long ago when we were out evangelizing, and his great concern as he shared his heart to me was this, I hope the Lord doesn't come tonight, because if he does, I'm not ready. That's sobering words, and it's words that I would ask this, this afternoon that you would think and ponder upon. If the Lord should come back for his bride tonight, would you be found ready? Would you be found a faithful bride? To her, we read, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. The righteousness of saints. The whole concept that is being painted here is one of fidelity, one of faithfulness, that the Lord is coming back for a bride pure, that are his, that are waiting for his return, that have kept themselves clean and pure. 
Our Lord said in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's not an optional. It's not optional. If, if you love me, then keep my commandments. This is my commandment in John 15 and verse 12, that you love one another as I have loved you. We heard it last night from David. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. In 1 John 3, 3, it says this, And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself. Every man that has what hope? The hope of seeing the Lord. When the bridegroom shall come and we shall behold him face to face, and we shall be like him in that hour. Every man that has this hope does something. He purifies himself. He seeks to keep himself spotless and undefiled. Even as he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is pure. Jude verse 21, and again an exhortation. And I'm trying to draw from scripture, not in isolation, but as a package that we would understand the thrust of what God is saying to us. In Jude verse 21, it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves to, to guard your heart. To keep yourselves in the love of God. And that is challenging. We've heard already, as, as um, Brother Chris has shared, of the pains that have come with serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The daggers that go into one ba in one's back. It was once said to me by a man of God that you're going to need now. This was upon when I was ordained as a pastor. You're going to need two targets on there. One on the front, you're going to have one on the back. The target on the front will be those of the world you'll see them coming. And the one on the back will be for Christians. You won't see them coming. And I'm asking in the midst of it, can we keep ourselves in the love of God? Despite me being hurt by those that I've trusted, we have a challenge on our hands that I can't allow my heart to grow cold. I can't allow bitterness to set in. But at all costs, I must keep the commandment of our Lord, the only commandment that he's given to us, that we love one another as he loved us. Keep yourselves, Jude says, in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That when he comes, we would be found a people on the earth, not as in Matthew 24, where the master turned on his servants. Chris is going to bring a message on heavy shepherds. Woe unto them shepherds that abuse the sheep, the sheep and the flock of Jesus Christ. I would not want to be standing in their shoes on the day of judgment. If ye offend one of these least, my brethren, the Lord Jesus said, it is better that you hand a millstone around your neck and it's cast into the sea. When the Lord comes, he's seeking that we would be faithful to God, to shepherd. I'm speaking of pastors, the flock of Jesus Christ. James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows, to show an act of compassion, to visit them in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from this world. To keep ourselves through our Lord, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, having therefore the pro these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. These aren't ideas. These aren't suggestions. This is the word of God. I'm trying to draw from all across the New Testament here. And in one clarion accord, they're saying the same thing. Having therefore, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, these, pro these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Is that your testimony this afternoon? Working out, allowing the salvation of God to literally work itself out of our lives, that we can say that a year from before, I'm not, not the person I was, I've moved on. Granted, we might have areas in our life where we can say, I'm not the people that I want to be, but at least, praise God, we can look back and we can see that ours is a journey of upward trajectory. Ours is one of going onward and upward with the Lord, that we can honestly say there's a purifying and a refining work being done in our life. Is that your testimony this afternoon, I ask you, dear brethren? Or do you look back with weeping and say that a year ago, oh, to God I was there again. 
Because it's easy in this Christian walk, in this Christian walk to get discouraged. It's easy to take our eye off the mark. And that is why fellowship is so important. That in the company of godly fellowship, I can be admonished by my brother, by my sister. I thank God my wife admonishes me all the time. And I have to listen to her admonishment. And if there's things in my life that are not the same as they used to be, I want to know. I want to know. There is a preparation, dear brethren, on our part, an active and a deliberate preparing of ourselves and of our hearts, which evidences what? It evidences faithfulness. Am I teaching works this afternoon? Absolutely not. The book of Romans, chapter 4, it clearly tells us, chapter 3, exactly how a man is saved. It's by faith. But if we mean by faith a, 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 a mental assent to some fact, and then we've missed the mark. Faith is to place one's confidence in, to trust. And the evidence that will always follow true faith is faithfulness. An outworking of that faith. I can't say, wife, I'm going to be faithful to you and then go and commit adultery. It's an oxymoron. And that act of betrayal betrays and shows for what it is that my faithfulness is nothing but treachery. No faithfulness. Are we faithfully preparing to meet our Lord Jesus Christ? Are you ready to meet your bridegroom? Are you a bride adorned for her bridegroom? Is Jesus Christ the lover of your soul? Is he the lover of your soul? We heard yesterday of how when we were first saved, that love, we didn't know all the theology, but we could say one thing, I love my Lord. I love my Lord. And I thank God that 16 years on from when I was first saved, with the same determination I can say, with the same passion, I love my Lord. He is everything to me. He's all the world, as that wonderful hymn says to me. Can you say that with an honest heart this afternoon? That he's my all. I have eyes for him alone. Does he captivate your heart? I have a little son, and I'm sure many of us have had children. And for those who are perhaps more advanced in years, you have grandchildren. And when you look upon those grandchildren, what runs through your heart? It is just pure adulation and joy, you know, at your grandson or as a young parent, I have, or as a parent, I have a young son. And when I look upon him, there's just a heart of, of, of adoration. I love him. Can we say that of the Lord this morning? Dear brethren, you are his wife and he is your husband. He's purchased you. His bride you are at the price of his own precious blood. Matthew 26 and verse 28, this is my blood, or this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. And it is on this basis that Paul could say, as we've read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul said, I'm jealous. I'm jealous, bride of Christ at Corinth. I'm jealous, I'm affectionately desirous of you. Just as though a, a man would come to try to tamper with my wife and holy jealousy would rise up within me, she's mine. And Paul said, what? I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy because I've betrothed you, I've espoused you to one husband that on that day I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And when Paul beheld the Corinthian church, he said, as you know, we know the false t-shirt teachers had come in and tarnished them. They were going astray. And Paul was jealous that that church might be the bride that Christ purchased and which Paul wanted to present to the Lord. I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That word chastity, we heard from Brother Chris yesterday, somewhat of this. It speaks of sexual purity, sexual purity, a chaste virgin to Christ. Now the idea of chastity in our generation, in our society is scoffed at by today's generation. It's scoffed at. I'm a school teacher and I mean sometimes the children are talking and when I say to them, well, you know, they're talking about this boyfriend or that girlfriend and I say that you should be thinking in terms of my future husband, my future wife and they have no idea of this. 
For them, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you mess around with them a bit, defile yourself. And I was guilty before I came to Christ, to my shame. And then suddenly, you somewhere in life stumble upon perhaps the wife-to-be, and then you present a defiled body to her, and she presents a defiled body to you. Well, the Word of God, and indeed ancient tradition and custom, actually derides, derides this idea. The sounding voices in our generation of the media, of social media, and the pressure upon the youth to what? To lose their virginity. I mean, it's coming at them from every single angle, Hollywood, social media. And dare a teenager stand up and say, you know what? I want to be pure for my future husband. Why there would be a mocking and a scoffing and a ridicule. It's deemed abnormal. Yet, as I said, in many traditions, including the Jewish one, a crucial part of the marriage ceremony, we've talked about the betrothal period, we've talked about the bridegroom coming to collect his bride to take her into the marriage supper. But another crucial part of the marriage ceremony was the consummating of the marriage. The consummating of the marriage. A ratifying in blood, a covenant. And without going into detail, a white sheet would be placed upon the marriage bed and would serve as what? And this is practiced today in African customs. Indeed, in many customs across the world, this practice is still um, goes on. A white sheet would be placed upon the marriage bed and it would serve as an external indicator of the bride's virginity, of her faithfulness to her husband during that betrothal period and up to that betrothal period. And dear brethren, how far we have fallen as a society who have become a nation of fornicators and adulterers. Now, why do I say that this, this afternoon? Because guess what? As I said, this irreverence for marriage has trickled down into our spiritual understanding of who we are in Jesus Christ. Look, Christ is our husband. The concept of fidelity and purity is placed upon us by the word of God. He's coming back for a chaste bride, for a pure virgin bride to collect and to bring to himself. I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And I want to simply ask, in light of all that I am saying this afternoon, are you keeping yourself? Try to think of this for a moment. I've betrothed, I've been betrothed, I'm now um, betrothed to a wife. I'm her husband. I've gone away to prepare a place for my wife. I'm coming back again. And upon my return, I'm seeking that she's been faithful to me, that she's kept herself chaste, a virgin, because I'm her husband and I'm coming back to complete the transaction. What then if upon my revival I discovered that, God forbid, she played the harlot? What would that do to my heart? What would that say about my or her fidelity to me as my husband? And dear brethren, there's nothing different in our spiritual walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our husband. He has gone away and he has left us in this earth. And he's coming back for a bride who have kept themselves pure for him. And this is a legalism that I'm talking. This is love. That I love my husband. That he is everything to me and I actively and deliberately and purposefully want to keep myself clean for him. It changes our perception somewhat, doesn't it? Christ, my husband. And I ask this morning, are you keeping yourself for your bridegroom? One of the greatest sins of God's ancient people, Israel, was their total disregard for marriage. For the married bed, marriage bed. God was their husband. And for me, I thank God that he's given us the Torah, the Old Testament, because it's there where nothing's new under the sun. God entered into a contract with his people. He walked with them. Exactly as God has entered into a contract with us and walks with us and we with him. There's nothing new under the sun. It says in Isaiah 54 and verse 5, for thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. 
Thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Turn please to Ezekiel chapter 16. I want to bring from this and read a few more scriptures before we close. Ezekiel chapter 16. And verses 1 through to 5. And then we will read verse 8. Ezekiel chapter 16. Verses 1 through to 5. This passage is so intimate, it shows us how God entered into covenant with his bride Israel. And we can parallel the same, how God has entered into covenant, Christ has entered into covenant with us. He is our husband, we are his bride, we've been betrothed, espoused to him. In Ezekiel chapter 16, I'll just read verses 1 through down to verses 5. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. As for thy nativity in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And if we drop down to verse 8, now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Graphic language of Israel's absolute abhorrence in all her idolatry. Remember, Abraham was no fine specimen he was an idolater his father was an idolater there was nothing inherently good about abraham but god said from his seed he would make a nation and we see that the lord here through the prophet ezekiel is showing us it with this graphic imagery of how the lord passed by this polluted people and drew them to himself and entered into covenant and, and you became my bride and i became your husband the Lord has a contention with his bride. In verse 2, Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. Her abominations. Turn please to Jeremiah chapter 3 and let us see in verse 6. Again as this is graphically portrayed. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verses 6. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 6. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She's gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backslide in Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. 98% of all that the prophets of Israel did, did, they did what? They called back a backsliding people, back unto God, back unto Yahweh. And they cried the same words as Christ himself cried in his day. How long he had sought to gather them as a hen does her chicks, but ye would not, ye would not.
the Lord cried out to the northern tribe of Samaria, turn back, but she refused. The Lord sent her into exile. Judah, her sister, the southern kingdom, going out into captivity later, saw the treachery of the northern kingdoms. Did it face them? Not at all. They played the harlot even worse. And God raised up Nebuchadnezzar to take them off into captivity. God said, I gave her a bill of divorce and sent her away. Speaking of the northern kingdom. Now, does there exist any greater? Does there exist any greater example, I asked this, this afternoon, of treachery and betrayal? That when a man takes himself and joins himself as a harlot... A friend betraying a friend is one thing, but a wife betraying another, a husband, is altogether a different one. And there exists on the face of the earth no greater treachery, no greater betrayal than when a spouse commits adultery and cheats and destroys the heart of her lover. And yet I fear this afternoon, as I stand before you this afternoon, that we have become a generation of Christians likened unto Israel that have done exactly that. Oh, granted, we've become far too sophisticated to bow down to stocks and stones. But the spirit of idolatry is altogether still alive and well. And dare I say, within the body, of Jesus Christ. Jesus puts it this way. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I ask you this afternoon, where is your heart? That you'd answer God. What captivates your heart? Can you say hand on heart, it is him alone? Because if it is not, then I ask, what do you play the harlot with? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What is the first and greatest commandment? It's simple, to love God. To love God. To love God. Mark twelve thirty: Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Notice the word all. With everything that is within me, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. This isn't legalism. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. And when you were first saved, you loved the Lord. It wasn't difficult. You didn't have to beat yourself into gear. You loved the Lord. What went wrong? Something else interposed and stepped in place of the Lord. That thing, whether it be a car, whatever it might be, now had your affection, now had your heart. It could be a career. And that love waxed cold and the Lord drew far from you. Paul says these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. As he closes out his epistle, he says this, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. That is strong language. They're not my words. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema maranatha. What captivates, I ask again, your heart this afternoon? This isn't to beat you over the head. This is about being honest before the Lord because I tell you something, when we're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, legalism goes out of the window because love motivates our everything. I want to pray today, Lord, because I love you. I want to share the gospel today with someone because I love you, Lord. I want to keep myself for you, Lord, because I love you, Lord. When love is the oil of the engine, as it were, I tell you what, it runs smoothly. But it's when we lack love that we turn what? To a crutch, to legalism, to rules and regulations, to keep ourselves in ship shape. And what happens? We grow colder. Our hearts wax colder. And I tell you, we need a revival of love because where love is in our hearts, it will not be difficult at all to serve the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
What infatuates your affections? Are you found this afternoon playing the harlot with this world having eyes for the things of this world? Spiritual adultery is well and alive in our land. Well and alive. Our Lord warns us in just three words. In Mark 17 and verse 32, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Why is our Lord telling us these things? He's coming back. Why is he telling us these things? Because what? Because wives, Lot's wife's heart was where? Back in Sodom. And looking back, she turned a pillar of salt. All throughout the scripture, dear brethren, the, word, the Lord is warning us in far stronger language than I'm warning us this afternoon. He's saying what? Be ready, be ready, be ready. James 4 and verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore will be a friend of this world that would pledge allegiance with this world, that would take the world to its heart, is the enemy of God. These are my words. What do we do with them? Do we take them out of scripture and bin them? We need again to open the word of God and just to read what's there. Because I fear that we have received a standard and that is so depraved and so far from the standard that the word of God brings. And my heart would be wood to God that he would raise up men in our generation that might be able to say as Apostle Paul did, follow me as much as I follow Christ. Because I fear we are lacking such an example. And our perception on the standard that God brings has been lost has been lost. Love not the world. 1 John 2 verse 15 and 16. Neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, we're told, passes away in the things thereof. But he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. Turn please to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 and then I'm going to end with a word of encouragement. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 11. Ah, oh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. Now, in the time of Corinth, they actively worshipped idols. I mean, they were an idolatrous people. They were saved out of idolatry. And idolatry was rife in the society. I mean, as I said, we've become too sophisticated for that. We don't go around bowing down to stones, although that there's a emergence of that, you know, with all that Chris has been sharing. It won't be long till men again are doing that. But an idol is what? Something that has your heart's affection. Yeah. You might not bow down literally, but our Lord said where your treasure is, what you deem to be most valuable, that is the thing that you will give your heart to. So idolatry is simply to give that which is deserving to God, namely our love and affection, and to give it supreme love and affection, that is, and to give it to another. Paul says this in verse 11, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Paul had shown this people such love, and he'd received such little love in return. Now for a recompense or repayment in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. 
Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, as we read, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Paul says to the believers at that day who had joined alliance with the idolaters, their former past, Look, it cannot be this way. Light is light and darkness is darkness. Come out. Let there be a separation. Holiness unto the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, I realize that this is a strong word that I am bringing, but a needful one. One that I first run through my own heart before I ever venture to seek to preach to you, dear ones. It first ministers to my own heart, lest I be a hypocrite. But I tell you something in my life, there's one thing that I want more than anything, and it's to love the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to finish well. It's to finish well. And perhaps this afternoon you're convicted. The Spirit of God is convicting your heart. And I'm not saying condemnation. Notice I said conviction because there's a world of differences. Condemnation is the voice of Satan telling us it's all over. Forget it. You're finished. The Lord is finished with you. That is condemnation. Conviction is altogether different. Turn ye again to the Lord. There's yet hope. Yes. This is the conviction of God. Amen. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Praise the living God. And I encourage you, there's nothing better. I mean, it's just the only way I can describe it. It's like coming home after a, work, a day's work, grafting in the garden. You're covered in soot and mud and you get into the bath and you get out that bath clean. And you feel altogether different. I tell you, before you make it right with God, that you're, under, you're under conviction, it's grimy, it's dirty. But when you turn to the Lord and you humble yourself and confess to agree with God, Lord, you're right, I'm wrong. I've strayed far from you. Forgive me, Lord, I'm coming home. By the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you, it is though you have been washed with water, cleansed by the Spirit of the living God, and there's a refreshing of the soul. I'm now again right with my Lord. There's an open heaven above my head. I don't have to play the hypocrite anymore, hiding in the closet what God sees and already knows. But we can bring what all out into the light. And I encourage you this morning and the, uh, this afternoon and the whole heart of this conference or part of it is what? That we might meet with God. That we might meet with God. Can you say this afternoon that there is an open heaven above your head? And what I mean by that, can you say that there is transparency before the Lord? Lord, you know what you see is who I am. And that is my prayer that we could say that. Finally, I want to turn please to Jeremiah chapter 3. As I finish a word of encouragement. Genesis, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 1. Going to read verse 1, then we're going to jump down to verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 1. Listen, I don't care this afternoon how far you may have wandered from God. What sin and what depth of depravity you've plunged yourself to. I tell you, there's hope. There's hope. 
In Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 1, they say, If a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Why, it's a rhetorical question. The one says, no, Deuteronomy 24 tells us that. That if a man puts away his wife and she joins herself to another and then seeks to come back to her husband, the Lord in Deuteronomy 24 said, no, the land will be polluted. You're not to do this. Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. See the mercy of God and his compassion towards his people is the same compassion as he extends to you and to me. You've played the harlot with many lovers, yet the Lord says with open arms, yet I say, return again, come back. To me, saith the Lord. And in verse 20 we read, in finishing verses 20 through to 25. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so ye have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. And we might well say, O church of Jesus Christ, saith the Lord. But listen to this beautiful voice that was heard. And oh, to God, we could hear that this again. Music to my ears. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. Why? For they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the Lord their God. This wasn't a cry of sorrow according to the world. Paul says that sorrow will lead to death. But there is such a thing as a godly sorrow which works what? Repentance. I'm not sorry that I've been caught. This wasn't a a cry of, oh God, you've caught us. This was a cry of godly sorrow. One of true repentance upon realizing what they had done. This cry was heard and it's really prophesying of the restoration, the future restoration of the nation of Israel. Verse 22, Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Do you believe that this this afternoon? How fond we are of telling sinners that the blood of Christ can cleanse them from their sin, but we're not very good at telling ourselves that. The blood of Christ cleanses from every single sin. And by faith, I exhort you this afternoon to rise up and to say, God, I know perhaps I may have failed you, but the blood of Christ avails for me. I receive it by faith, Lord. You are able to cleanse. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. This is a cry of repentance. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. They had realized their idolatry was but in vain. It was empty. And from the multitude of mountains, speaking of the high places where they would go up and worship the other gods, truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel, the deliverance of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our confusion covers us. Confusion covers us. Shame. and For we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers from our youth even unto this day and I have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. And so this afternoon I've sought to bring what I believe the Lord has placed upon my heart. A bride adorned for her bridegroom. We may well be able to point out the heretics and to show and list all the false teachers and false teachings. And there can come a pride and an arrogance with that. We need to be aware of these things. But we, when the Lord comes, he's coming for a bride. 
And we have to ask ourselves this, this afternoon, where are our hearts before the Lord? And that would be what I would leave with you as we close now, as we go, I think, to a time of prayer, that we would ponder these things. The Lord loves you dearly, dearly. My words don't even do justice to explain the love that he has for your soul, but I plead with you, his arms are outstretched. Why will you continue in sin when his arms are outstretched to forgive you to the uttermost? He's coming back for a bride, a chaste virgin. Let us wash ourselves and cleanse ourselves in the blood of Christ and lift up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving me grace to share this word. I just absolutely rest, Lord, that what I've shared is just from you, Father. No effort, no trying to manipulate events. God, thy word has gone forth. And I now commend into your faithful hands these precious souls, every single one of them, that you, Lord God, would bring the fruit of this word and that, my Lord, your name would be glorified. Come now, thou gracious God, and work in your sovereign hand to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, that, Lord, a faithful, chaste bride might be presented to the bridegroom, our husband, Jesus the Christ. I pray in his precious name. Amen.